It's time to talk about June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. When you're playing, you solve a mind-teasing mystery of the roaring 1920s while you dive into June's captivating quest to uncover a scandalous family secret and solve her sister's murder. It's mystery, it's danger, and it's romance, and you never know where the next chapter's gonna take you. If that wasn't fun enough, you get to customize your very own luxurious island estate. Seriously, I cannot stop playing. I am already on the third chapter, and I just started recently. Join me back in time in the glamorous 1920s. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. Patrons heard this episode ad-free first. You can become a patron, too, and enjoy extra Murder Diaries content by going to patreon.com slash the Murder Diaries pod, or click the link in the show notes or our bio on Instagram. Thank you to Lisa for becoming our newest Patreon. Welcome to the Murder Diaries. I'm Natalie. And I'm Paige. Today, it's common knowledge that the most dangerous time for a victim of abuse is when they're trying to leave their abuser. It often takes multiple attempts for a victim to get the help they so desperately need and deserve. When you hear those facts, what do you think of? Most likely you thought of adults trying to escape their romantic partners. But what about the children? What happens when children try to escape their abusers? And what if that abuser is their parent? Today we're talking about one of those children, his mother, and her desperate fight to get her children to safety. Tragically, they were never able to get there. His name was Grant Solomon. This is his story. You still think it's in my head, but I'm walking with the dead. Grant Rhodes Huffins Solomon was born on June 13th, 2002, in Franklin, Tennessee, to parents Angie and Aaron Solomon. Angie is a pharmacist, and Aaron is a former WSMV Channel 4 news anchor and Merrill Lynch financial advisor. Together, they had two children, Grant and a daughter named Gracie. The first paragraph of his obituary reads, quote, Grant walked boldly for Jesus. His smile lit up every room he entered. Grant was known for being a fiercely competitive athlete, an engaged scholar, and a true friend to everyone he encountered. With a strong sense of family, he took extra care of his little sister and mom, end quote. In general, Grant was known for caring deeply for the people closest to him. We were able to talk with Grant's mom, Angie, and she highlighted Grant's caring nature. He was a very, very deep soul. It radiated from him. Grant's first words were dog and ma. Ma always felt a little country to Angie, but... Grant quickly adopted it and was fond of using it to refer to her. I always felt like Granny Clampett when he said that from the, because he was just a ma, but um, he always called me ma and kind of laugh about it. Angie also expressed how smart Grant was. He loved to read and started excelling in school at a young age. Angie said that she isn't a big reader and didn't read much to Grant, but even as a baby, Grant would sit with a giant pile of books and look through them for hours. She soon discovered that Grant had a photographic and auditory memory, so he would memorize everything he read and saw. Needless to say, he quickly devoured all of the books in the house. Grant had attended Grace Christian Academy in Franklin, Tennessee since the third grade. He was a National Merit Scholar and had a 4.4 honors GPA. He was one of those kids to whom school came easy. He didn't have to study much to get good grades. After Grant's death, Angie asked one of his best friends what he missed most about Grant. The friend responded that he missed Grant's wisdom. He said that Grant was someone he could go to when he needed to talk. And Grant always responded with something really deep or honest. Grant seems like such a great kid. From everything Angie said, he was one of those kids who wanted to make everyone around him happy and who everyone loved to be around. In addition to Grant's academic skills, he was a gifted dual athlete and played on his school's baseball and basketball teams. Even though he competed in both sports, baseball was his true love and Angie said it was his sanctuary. Grant was protected on the field from everything he dealt with at home, but more on that later. No one who harmed Grant could touch him while on the field. It was just Grant, the other players, 
and the sport he loved. And Grant was good. Angie said that Grant was being recruited. In 2019, Grant's team made it all the way to the Class A state baseball tournament, with Grant leading the way for his team. His coach, Brad Meyer, said this about Grant. He competed like none other and got the most out of his days here on Earth. As we mentioned, Grant used baseball to escape his home life. In order to understand Grant's case and his death, it's pretty essential to know his father's alleged history and violence, which started with Angie. Angie and Aaron met in high school, and right away they didn't have a good relationship. Aaron had stalked me in high school. I I just thought he was just ugly, weird, and short, and gross. I still do. But uh, I was raised Church of Christ, but I felt like if I ha- wasn't good to everyone, I would go to hell. So I knew that there were people that I thought, like, refusing a guy or being like, no, I'm not, that would be not nice. So in 2001, 2000, I was, uh, had my own home. I had my own, um, had two boxers. I was a pharmacy manager, fenced in backyard of Jeep that I had designed myself and they shipped it. You know, I was, I, I was in a very good place. And, uh, I was, I thought, you know, I, I think I'll make a list of people that, um, a lot of friends I lost contact with that were good people because of college and pharmacy school. And and then there are some people that always just kind of bothered me that I felt like I had treated them poorly and I should do that. I should. That's wrong, girls. Don't do that. The, the message to the girls out there is no, you, you can you could let the monster in. If you do, you do not have to go back and apologize to somebody for standing your ground. You need to keep walking because you stood your ground the first time for a reason. And you don't need to let that lay on your heart or your mind. God doesn't want you to do that either. If people were raised like me, they, no, no, no. The, you can open the door and it it would be as lightning striking that you would find, that you would open the door to evil, pure evil, like I did. But it's possible. And I, there's some, that's part of the story that is, uh, not pretty at all. None of it's pretty, but this is not pretty. But I, you know, I, I want people to know that that is what I did. I put him on the list um, at the bottom. Eventually, however, Angie got to the bottom of her list and reached out to Aaron via email. The email was simple and polite. Angie said something along the lines of, you're doing a great job with work and I hope things continue to work out for you. Unfortunately, that was all it took for Aaron to latch on to Angie. Soon enough, the stalking started again. He found Angie's house and would leave her food despite her refusal to go out with him. At some point, Aaron invited Angie to a Tennessee Titans football game in Jacksonville. Because of his job as a news anchor, Aaron was able to get them passes so they could be on the field. She knew that Aaron would be working at the game and she wasn't concerned about going on a trip with him. Angie never thought that Aaron would hurt her. After the game in their hotel room, Aaron brought Angie a diet Mountain Dew, which Angie said was her crutch. Angie remembers drinking the Mountain Dew and then blacking out. When she came to the next morning, Aaron was on top of her and sexually assaulting her. After the trip, things escalated quickly. Aaron started trying to move into Angie's house, even going so far as moving his stuff in when Angie wasn't there. As much as Angie fought back, she wasn't able to stop him and she didn't know what to do. Around this time, Angie found out she was pregnant with Grant. She wanted to raise Grant by herself, but at that point, her father, who was controlling and abusive in his own way, stepped in and spoke to Aaron. Following this conversation, Aaron told Angie that if she didn't marry him, her father was going to kill her. Fearing for her life, Angie agreed to marry Aaron. Our marriage was not a marriage of love. It was a marriage of force. After Angie and Aaron got married and as their family grew, first with Grant and then with Gracie, Aaron's control got worse. He liked to have complete power over the family and control everything Angie, Grant, and Gracie did. Our life with Aaron was so, it was isolating and it was uh, terrifying and we walked on eggshells. We never knew what was going to set him off. He wouldn't allow me to go get my hair done without him there. He wouldn't allow me to go to any doctor's appointment. OBGYN, follow-ups, dentist, general practitioner. mm -mm. He was always there. Always there in the room. 
always watching. When Gracie was born, he stepped that up an, an additional notch. And he was, I mean, registered for school, pick grant up from school. Any opportunity that we had to interact with adult, other adults or people in charge of something, he made sure that we didn't talk. After Gracie was born, the abuse escalated. It's important to make sure and note that everything in this section is alleged. All of our information comes from news articles and from Angie and Gracie themselves. Angie told us that Aaron had always controlled her and Grant. But after Gracie was born, the abuse became even more physical. She said that he would shove her and even pushed her down the stairs in front of the kids. He also wouldn't let her bathe Gracie, which he insisted that he do by himself. As the abuse escalated, Angie started creating an escape plan for her and the children. However, no matter what she tried, Aaron always found out. Around 2013, Aaron filed for divorce from Angie and for custody of Grant and Gracie. Aaron was well known in town and made it difficult for Angie to fight for her children. She struggled to find an attorney who would help her and who would go against Aaron. During their court proceedings, Angie alleged that Aaron was physically, mentally, and sexually abusive to both her and the children. But the court said that her allegations lacked merit. Despite Angie's allegations of abuse, Aaron was awarded custody of Grant and Gracie. What followed was a years-long battle for custody of Grant and Gracie. Angie tried to get help from her community, such as through her church and from law enforcement, but she struggled to get the protection she needed. She tried to file lawsuits against Aaron, but they were all dismissed. Aaron's influence over the town was too strong. Aaron's custody went terrified Grant and Gracie. They were scared to live with their father and were devastated to live without Angie. Angie said that Gracie had a breakdown at one point when it was time for Aaron to take her home, away from her mother. She clung to Angie's body until Aaron's attorney told him to rip her off of her. This didn't stop Angie from fighting for her children. Eventually, she was banned from filing lawsuits and court proceedings against Aaron. She was told to stop talking about the alleged abuse because it made people uncomfortable. In 2018, Grant and Gracie ran away from Aaron and went to live with Angie. Angie said that Grant stayed with her permanently after that and that the COVID-19 pandemic helped act like a buffer between them and Aaron. Gracie has been pretty open about the alleged abuse. In 2021, a YouTube video was uploaded in which Gracie shared her story. Although we won't be playing any clips from that video, we wanted to acknowledge that Gracie did give us permission to do so if we needed to for this episode. Gracie alleged that her father sexually abused her for most of her life and that even after moving out of his house, he continued to stalk and harass her. Gracie alleges that her community also failed her. The systems designed to help and support children like Gracie haven't done so. In the video, Gracie says that she tried to get help from the pastor of her church, but he and the church didn't do anything. Additionally, Gracie alleges that after the summer of 2020, Aaron began showing up at her school and adults in the school did nothing to stop him. This was after Gracie was granted a temporary restraining order against Aaron, which he was violating. Gracie alleged in her video that Grant was also afraid of Aaron, but he did his best to protect her and Angie from him. Grant acted as a buffer between Aaron and his mother and sister. Angie told us that they didn't realize how much Grant was protecting them until after his death and the buffer was gone. Grant desperately wanted to get his family out of Aaron's clutches. He even planned to apply for custody of Gracie once he turned 18. As happens all too often, however, he would never get the chance. And now a word from today's sponsor. Honestly, I never spent enough time just on myself. As a counselor in my nine to five, I spend a lot of time on other people and helping to take care of them. Resources like therapy and BetterHelp have helped me learn how to balance taking care of myself and others. It's so easy to get caught up in everyone else's needs and forgetting to take a moment to think about what I need from myself. But when we spend all of our time giving, it can leave us feeling stretched thin and burned out. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. Therapy is helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. 
It isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. You don't have to be at rock bottom to start today. Give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out the brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. If that therapist isn't working out the best for you, you can switch therapists anytime, no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash murder diaries today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash murder diaries. On July 20th, 2020, a month after Grant turned 18 and shortly before the start of his senior year of high school, Grant had an evaluation of his pitching at the Ward Performance Institute in Gallatin, Tennessee. Aaron would be at the evaluation, something that made Grant incredibly nervous. Angie told us, It was the first time he was alone with Aaron in two years. Grant didn't want to go to the evaluation because... He didn't want to be alone with Aaron. Angie told Aaron that Grant didn't want him at the evaluation, but he didn't listen. Leading up to the evaluation, Grant told Angie that he didn't want to die in Gallatin. Angie told us that Grant believed that Aaron was going to hurt him and that it might happen that day when they were alone together. She doesn't know what made Grant feel that way. If there had been some sort of altercation or tension between them, all she knows is she told Aaron on the morning of the 20th, that Grant didn't want to die in Gallatin. An hour after she texted Aaron telling him about Grant's fears, she got a call that Grant was dead in Gallatin. Aaron was the only witness to Grant's death, so we don't really exactly know what happened. We only know what Aaron said. According to Aaron, Grant parked his truck in the parking lot of the Ward Performance Institute next to Aaron's car. Grant then got out of his truck and went around to the bed of the truck to get his baseball gear. As he was doing this, the truck rolled backwards and somehow dragged Grant across the parking lot, down a small hill and into a ditch. While this was happening, Aaron was sitting in his car looking at emails on his phone. Aaron called 911 at 8.44 a.m. I'm trying. Where's your emergency? It's 1357 South Water Street. It's off 109. Please hurry. You said 57? Please hurry. Okay, what's going on? 57. Uh, my, my son's truck backed over him, and he, it's rolled over him and dragged him into the ditch, and it's on top of him. He's trapped under the truck, and I... I yeah, he... I, I, somehow it drug him underneath it. Yes, my son is under it. I'm trying to... No, I'm, I'm trying to call 911. Okay, what's your name? Oh, my God. My name is Aaron Solomon. And you said oh my God. 1357 Southwater Avenue, right? Yes. How old yes. is the male? He's 18. He just turned 18 a couple weeks, about a month ago. It's my son. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This is not good. Is he awake? Oh, please hurry. Please? I don't know. I don't think so. He's not... Oh, he's not... Alert, right? No, he's out. And he's trapped. I got three guys here, and he's trapped under the truck. Okay. Oh, my God. I understand, sir. Stay on the phone with me while we get somebody out there. What's your name? Aaron Solomon. All right, Aaron. Huh? What kind of vehicle is it? It's a Toyota Tacoma, Tacoma, and it's the, the vehicle has to, he's underneath the vehicle. Okay, I've got and the, that. And, and it's. Okay, I've got that. What color is it? It's a white truck. That's my son. It's somehow it's backed up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on one, I'm on with 911 right now. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Was your son working on it? No, no, he was just getting out of it. It's the hill, it's, we're on an incline, and I guess he didn't have it in park or something, or it wasn't engaged, or, oh, oh my God. Oh, my God, I can't believe this. Is still not responding? No, no. And he's still under no. truck. No one can get yes. out from under it. No, it's no. We saw units and routes to you. I'm just asking you questions for we can huh? update them, okay? 
Can you check and see huh? where you've been? I, I, somebody's telling me that he's coming too. Okay. Maybe. He is, is waking up Maybe. Kind, kind of keeping still. So he is. Well, he can't, yeah, he can't move. I don't think he can move. I, I don't know. Okay. I no, he can't move. He's trapped. Okay. Well, we got somebody in round. Now, when he wakes uh, up, he might I'm be telling scared. You, can somebody I'm get telling down him. there and talk to him? Yeah, somebody talk to him. Shit. Gee, there's blood. What, is he facing up or down? He's facing up. They said he may aspirate. We need to hurry. Oh, my God. So does he have blood coming out of his mouth? Yeah, he's, yeah. there's blood coming out. Yeah, somehow it drug him down, I think. I don't know whether it was in his heart or what or if it didn't engage the brake or it drug him underneath somehow. Okay. They said he's facing up, Okay. but he's bleeding from his mouth. So, Grant, turn your face to the side if you can, barely, but be careful. Don't move him, okay? No, we can't move him. We can't. We can't move him. Oh my God. All right, he's in there. There, I'm gonna let you go, okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Uh huh. Bye bye. You may have noticed that it sounds like there are other voices in the background of the call, especially when Aaron says, yes, my son is under it. I'm trying to call, no, I'm trying to call 911. It almost sounds like Aaron is saying this to someone who is at the scene with him. This matches up with his claim that there are three men with him, which he tells the operator. The noises in the background support this, but strangely, when the ambulance and police arrive at the scene, the only person there is Aaron. Aaron said the men were driving a white box truck, but no one at the scene saw a truck. So if what Aaron said is true, there were three men in the ditch with Grant and sometime during the four minute and 20 second call, after the voices were heard, but before police arrived, the men left. We have to question why they would leave a teenager dying in a ditch, why they wouldn't want to give statements to the police about what happened. They had already started to help Grant, so why stop? Paramedics arrived on scene around 8.48 a.m., four minutes after Aaron called 911, and found Grant lying on his back under the front of the car between the tires. There was blood coming from his nose, mouth, and ears. Paramedics noted that Grant was unresponsive, which again contradicts Aaron's statement. On the 911 call, he said that Grant was waking up. Aaron also repeatedly said that Grant was trapped under the car, and while it was true that Grant was under the car, he wasn't trapped. As far as we can tell, no part of the car was on top of Grant or pinning him in place. After removing Grant from under the car, he was taken to the hospital, where he was pronounced dead sometime before 9.30 a.m. We'll talk about this more in a second, but Grant didn't undergo an autopsy. His death certificate lists his cause of death as multiple blunt force traumas caused by being run over by a car. His medical records add that Grant went into cardiac arrest and had a pulmonary embolism. He also had a laceration to the back of his head and a skull fracture. Aaron's strange and inconsistent behavior didn't stop with the 911 call. From the minute the accident occurred, it seemed like Aaron had rushed to declare his son dead, even before he was pronounced dead by doctors. Aaron had refused a helicopter flight for Grant and turned down other medical services, such as an autopsy, without consulting Angie. While at the hospital, Aaron allegedly started planning Grant's funeral right away, even trying to book someone to sing. Witnesses at the hospital say that they heard Aaron repeatedly tell Angie that Grant's organs could still be donated up until 9 p.m. that night without the use of a ventilator. From the moment Grant got hurt, Aaron was controlling the narrative and calling all of the shots. When Angie arrived at the hospital, she was allowed to see Grant. She was confused by the story Aaron gave police and said that it didn't seem consistent with his injuries. As a doctor of pharmacy, Angie was a medical professional and thought that Grant didn't have enough injuries for the accident that was reported to have happened. Aaron said that Grant was dragged across a parking lot and into a ditch filled with rocks. Why didn't he have more cuts and bruises? Why didn't he have any burns from the hot vehicle? How did he have so few injuries? When Angie saw her son lying cold in a hospital bed on a ventilator, 
She said that he had three bruises and one laceration on his head, yet he was dead. Gracie was able to see her brother as well. Both she and Angie felt an emotion they didn't expect, relief. Grant was at peace. He was finally free from a life that had been full of suffering. The investigation into Grant's death was short-lived. The police accepted Aaron's account of the accident as the truth and ruled that Grant had been killed after being struck by his truck. They then closed the case. Because Aaron had declined an autopsy, investigators weren't able to closely examine Grant's body to see if his injuries matched Aaron's story. Aaron had also refused a forensic examination of Grant's truck, which could have helped police determine if Grant was really hit by the car. The truck was released by police to a private tow yard. And within 48 hours, Aaron had custody of it. He refused to give the truck to Angie or Gracie and kept making excuses about why they couldn't have it. Eventually, Angie and her friend found the truck at a junkyard and were able to buy it back. In addition to not examining the truck, the Gallatin police didn't gather any evidence from the truck. They didn't request any of Grant's belongings for analysis, such as his phone, shoes, socks, or necklace. They didn't ask for the black box in Grant's truck. They didn't follow up on the mysterious three male witnesses Aaron talks about. They didn't follow up with Aaron even though his story changed three times in 15 minutes. They didn't question why his injuries were not in line with being dragged by a truck. They also didn't bother to accurately depict the scene. In the sketch they drew of the parking lot, Grant's truck was drawn on the wrong side of the ditch. Currently, the best path towards an investigation is through other crimes. A private investigation revealed that Aaron had committed insurance fraud. Tennessee Attorney General Jonathan Scrimetti, former chief legal counsel to Governor Bill Lee, claimed that Governor Lee suggested that the fraud aspect of the case could be used as a potential avenue for a federal invitation. Other than that statement, it isn't known if federal investigators are even looking into the case or Aaron Solomon. Absolutely no explanation has been given for the many, many questions that remain today. Such as, if Grant's death occurred the way Aaron said it did, why would he refuse an autopsy and forensic analysis of the truck? Those aren't the only confusing facts in this case, though. Eight days after Grant's death, Aaron described Grant's death on video to Angie. He indicated that Grant was getting his baseball gear from the back seat and not from the bed of the truck like he had previously stated. If that was true, then how was it possible for the truck to hit and drag him? And if it did drag him, then why didn't Aaron hear any cries for help? It's unclear where Grant's gear was found, but we do know that Grant normally put his gear in the back seat, not the bed. Additionally, Angie said that nothing in the truck seemed moved. It seemed just as Grant would have left it. If Grant had been hit while grabbing his gear, wouldn't he have dropped the gear? Or at the very least, wouldn't the gear be in a different spot from where he left it? The only thing out of place? Grant's aluminum baseball bat. Grant would have had the bat with him, but when police arrived on the scene, it wasn't there. Another strange thing is Grant's phone. Grant had a habit of communicating with his girlfriend when he arrived at a new location and before he got out of the car. But on the morning he died, Grant didn't message her. His phone was also missing. Police didn't find it on Grant's body and it wasn't found at the scene. Also, Aaron never went down to the ditch to be with Grant as he lay dying. At one point, the 911 operator told Aaron to go down and be with Grant because he might be scared. Aaron, however, didn't do that. Instead, he stood at the top of the hill and shouted at those three men who he claimed were at the scene. He told the men, who may or may not have actually been there, to sit with Grant. Aaron never once went down to be with the son. Angie told us about one more strange puzzle piece in Grant's death. We found out recently that Grant did not even have an appointment that day for a pro-style pitching evaluation, which is what everything is hinged on. That's right. Grant wasn't even scheduled to be in Gallatin with Aaron. So why was he? We're not the only people who find all of this strange. In November of 2021, protesters gathered in front of Tennessee State Capitol in Nashville. They held signs that read, hashtag justice for Grant and hashtag free Gracie. They were hoping to pressure the Gallatin Police Department into reopening the investigation into Grant's death. Angie started a change.org petition to fight for a new investigation. 
The petition is specifically directed towards the Gallatin Police Department, the Sumner County Sheriff's Office, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations, and the District Attorney's Office. Despite the protests, over 200,000 signatures on the petition and the overall strangeness behind Grant's death, the Attorney General said that there just still wasn't enough evidence to further investigate. Angie is determined to find answers in her son's death. The things we need most are subpoenas, exhumation, and an autopsy. And all of that is lined up, but we need funds to make sure that I, and I even hate to say that, but we have a GoFundMe set up. Uh, It's Justice for Grant. I established a Love Like Grant Foundation so that um, he is remembered uh, for who he was and what he was, not for all the questions that were left that day. In addition to the petition, GoFundMe and Foundation for Grant, there's also a movement for Gracie on Instagram called Freedom for Gracie, which has its own petition. Angie is grateful for the support she and Gracie have received on social media and is hoping the media in Tennessee will take more action. She told us that because Aaron is so influential in town, the best way for progress to be made is for people outside of Tennessee to bring attention to the case. We'll leave you today with Angie's words. I will not stop fighting until the answers are here. Make sure and follow us on all of our socials at the Murder Diaries pod. And until next time, stay safe. Bye. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the roaring 20s. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games.